Come on. Okay. As, as usual, you, you finish too soon, but it's nothing to be ashamed of. Remember that line? Yeah. We'll just finish together once. <laughs> you sound good tonight. Great. Yeah. Yes, okay. This just came in on the newswire. All California residents are going to be evacuated immediately <laughs> to get away from the danger of that fiery red ball in the sky. <laughs> Finally, maybe. Today, our governor, Governor Duke Magian, declared a flounder the state bird. <laughs> oh, this is gonna be nice tonight. You make up for last night. We had kind of a long night. Huh? <clears throat> what the hell was that? <laughs> That doesn't sound like a thing of mm, game over. <laughs> let me let me check with my director. Bobby, what, what was that strange sound? That was one of the flounder going up. The Never mind. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> anyway, the, last night was kind of rough. It was the kind of crowd that would ask Queen Elizabeth if she wanted to buy some postcards of Coo Stark. You know that. Uh, you know what I like about Friday? Only two days till Monday. <laughs> I'm just Joe. Come on, don't turn on me. <laughs> While you're out here, I recommend this place. Um, people think I have an interest in it, but I don't. It's on Burbank's famed restaurant row. It's um, Vinnie Abruzzi's Little Touch of Newark. Uh, <laughs> it's a tough restaurant where the mobsters meet the lobsters. <laughs> Vinny told me at lunch today his brother had died suddenly this morning. I said, my gosh, what happened? He said, I had him start up my car. <laughs> I told you it was a rough place. I had a great dish there last night, chicken gangland style. Uh, <laughs> they don't bring it to your table, it's thrown gagged and bound from a speeding car. <laughs> I had a rough week with a dentist. How many, who went to, how many people went to the dentist this week? Just, anybody? I had some root canal work done. Well, the sound's terrible, and it was terrible. Yeah, I went to our dentist here at NBC, Dr. Seymour Homaney. <laughs> I don't know where he got his training, but he straps you in the chair, turns on the drill, and says, all right, fine hunt, fair as the allies landing. <laughs> Well, the sun actually peeked through the clouds. It just came out for a moment at Malibu, but actor George Hamilton, who lives out there, uh, luckily is a graduate of the Evelyn Wood School of Speed Tanning. <laughs> and the Santa Monica Pier, famous landmark, I guess, is, is pretty well gone, right? And gone with it are some of the great gourmet eateries <laughs> on the pier. Where else in the world could you get such delicacies as a frozen turkey drumstick dipped in caramel? <laughs> yum, yum, yum. <laughs> or a spam cone with chocolate sprinkles. <laughs> My favorite was candied kelp on a stick. I mean, they're real great stuff. Did you see um, in the paper today what President Reagan is asking the television networks to do? The president has proposed that the television networks begin covering good news. He wants, he wants to set aside a week or a, a segment, apparently during the news shows, regularly for good news. <laughs> I can see it all now. Dan Rather looking at the camera and saying, and now for the good news, Jessica Savage has just invited me into her hot tub for a drink. <laughs> That's the good news. Tonight, the Reagans are having dinner with uh, Her Majesty, the Queen of England, and Prince Philip aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia. I understand Queen Elizabeth is getting even for the Mexican dinner. <laughs> that they had at the Reagan Ranch last week. They're serving boiled beef and warm beer. 
What do you think happens this Sunday in the sporting scene? Yeah. The new football league kicks off, believe it or not, this Sunday. The Los Angeles Express play host to the New Jersey Generals with Herschel Walker. Starts out here, I guess, Sunday. And the Generals, I understand, have put in a secret play already for Walker. Quarterback hands the ball and says, pretend you're running to the bank. <laughs> Anyway, tonight, we got a good show for you tonight. Uh, Mr. Tim Conway is here. Well, yeah. I agree. Miss, uh, Miss Jody Foster is with us tonight. And a very, very bright comedian, Maureen Murphy. And, and as a surprise later on, the chairman of the 1984 Olympic Committee will come out here and tell us they've just added a new event uh, to the Olympics called the 100-yard run through the mud with all your belongings. <laughs> we'll be out here. So thank you for coming. We'll be out here. You know why everybody's in such a good mood, those of you around the rest of the country? The sun finally came finally. out today in California, and it's starting to dry beautiful. out. And apparently the storm that was supposed to come down here over this weekend is... Bypassing. ...has uh, been canceled. Yes, sir. <laughs> we'll not play here. Uh -huh. Good news. Who cancels those storms? I don't know. We shouldn't talk. Northern California's also had it, all yeah. up and down the California coast. But I never saw weather like that. I have not either. Anyway, tonight is not officially, but since we're not going to be here Sunday night, oh, yes. or next week, uh, it was apropos to wish you happy birthday, Thank which you. is actually Sunday. Sunday. Happy birthday. Sunday. Thank you very much. Happy birthday. Hi, Thank you. It is a, uh, it's a biggie. You're heading there. We're all going at the same rate. It's 6-0. That's you're, a big one. You're going to be 60? 6-0. You're getting a little old for this show. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering when you were to tell me that. <laughs> no way. Anyway, we did a little, little research. Oh, I see. This into your great. life. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and we have a, we have some a, never before photos <laughs> and some photos here. <laughs> oh boy, you know that nothing first of, one. We know, you know nothing about this. No. We hardly know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> to show you how quick this was put together. <laughs> Late this afternoon? Uh, very late this afternoon. This was handed to me, uh, thrown from a speeding Buick. <laughs> Writers on their way home says, try this. <laughs> they left for the weekend. Oh, he's not the same guy gave you believe it or shove it, is Yes, he? yes. <laughs> believe it or stuff it, <laughs> not shove it. Well, what you did with it, you shoved it. <laughs> All right. Your birthday is March 6th, making you a Pisces. Right. Which is the sign of the fish. Right. And it's appropriate. <laughs> what does that mean? You drink like a fish. <laughs> I may edit this as I go along. This is... <laughs> you were born in Detroit. Yes. Now, you don't have to, you don't have to say anything. You just right. listen. Okay. Right. You were born in Detroit in the back seat of a DeSoto on an assembly line. <laughs> as a very sentimental occasion, because nine months earlier to the day, you were conceived in the back of that same DeSoto. <laughs> You were born into a poor, but completely dishonest family. <laughs> your parents were very proud when they heard your very first words, what time is the happy hour? <laughs> <laughs> Due to a misprint in your birth certificate, you were known as Edna McMahon. <laughs> Here you are right. <laughs> you were raised as a girl until the age of 18. When, after the senior prom, you checked into an adult motel and tried to score with yourself. <laughs> Naturally, you struck out. <laughs> your family moved around a lot. This was primarily because your father followed an old McMahon tradition, forgetting where he parked the car. <laughs> War came. You enlisted in the Marine Corps because you wandered into a recruiting office after you saw a sign outside that said U.S. M.C. And you thought that stood for unbelievably strong margaritas with chips. <laughs> oh. 
I'm reading this for the first time. Like it. <laughs> you served your country proudly. When captured by the enemy, you gave only your name, rank, serial number, and the exact location of every one of your buddies. <laughs> When you got out of the service, you moved to Southern California, where you got a job at SeaWorld, guest hosting for Shamu when he was on vacation. Ed, now I know this, you are a staunch Catholic. When you go to confession, you not only tell the priest your sins, but you insist on showing your Polaroid snapshots. <laughs> Let's see what the next page will bring. You're enjoying this. Oh, yes. First time. Ever the ladies' man, here you are asking five cocktail waitresses to guess what you just had delivered from the drugstore. <laughs> Did I do that, Page? Yes. I guess so. Well, this makes no sense. I'm behind it, Page. <laughs> we'll get this work out. Ah, here we are. Now, that one's not too good anyway. <laughs> You broke into show business when you starred in your first play, A Streetcar Named Obese. <laughs> Not true. That's from, uh... The Impossible Years. The Impossible Year. Years, right? Then you got a television break as host of the short-lived network game show, Way That Black Man. <laughs> Down on your luck, you were forced to appear in an X-rated science fiction film, Trixie and the Cucumber Salesman. I said, folks, this came out of a Buick. Of course, there were the scandals. Police broke into your Hollywood motel room and arrested you while practicing your strange fetish, strapping trumpet players to howitzer shells. Now, here's the first picture of you and me together. Right after you kidnapped me from my family. <laughs> That's right. That is, that is Ed holding me, taken from my parents as they were taking the NBC tour. And your ransom demand was a strange one. You wanted to sit next to me on a couch forever. Right. And on the occasion of your 60th birthday, I'd like to propose to you an ancient... An ancient Irish toast. Okay. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the rain fall softly upon your fields and upon you, who are usually lying unconscious in that field. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Woo. I love that. Hey, what? I kidnapped you. I kidnapped you. Kidnapped. Most people don't know. That was yeah. an un until tonight. That was yeah. an untold story that I was actually kidnapped yeah. while my folks took a tour. <laughs> and here we are together. Anyway, happy birthday, my friend. Thank you, sir. And, uh, Very nice. What is this? It's not great. Whatever it is, let me tell you. <laughs> mm. That should have gone through a few more times. <laughs> 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 Right, boy. One more. Okay, we'll take a break. We have Tim Conway, Jody Foster, and Maureen Murphy will join us out here. My first guest. My first guest. I consider a good friend. I'm a great admirer of his, uh, as a, both as a comedian, uh, actor, performer. I Tim does some writing also. Uh, he's starring in a new television series. No kidding. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> what a bulletin. Called Ace Crawford, Private Eye. That's why, why you... <laughs> Which premieres Tuesday, March 15th at 8 p.m. Mr. Tim Conway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just 
just fine, thank you. Oh, sorry, hello. <laughs> Did you hear the, well, you probably couldn't, you were behind the curtain, the excitement that went through the audience when there I said. There was a flutter there that uh, I, I did recognize, <laughs> yes. Well, it's, it's been a banner year for me, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, what, what have you been up to? Uh, well, what with this uh, new series coming out and everything, this will uh, this'll about do it for me. Uh, <laughs> This is not your first uh, series. No, uh, eight is my lucky number. Uh, we're, um, we're rolling along with this one. Yeah, this will uh, this will do it for me. Yeah. Right. Uh, actually, this one's a hit, so we're not worried about that. Oh, one. The others were. Yeah, the others uh, were yeah. a little shaky, but um, this one's right over the top already. We're all we're already renewed for five years, and so I'll probably be into syndication and right on my way to a very wealthy neighborhood. <laughs> No Woodland Hills movie yeah. home for you, right? <laughs> no, sir. No, no, yeah. no, no. No, I was talking to McLean the other day. I said, you know, <laughs> I feel like... <laughs> if, if we wait, they'll understand come along. they're taking There's them no... on the shade yeah. once yeah. a day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah this is a good one, though. We don't ability. see each other too often. We talk occasionally. Uh, well, that's my responsibility, too, Johnny. <laughs> Gosh, uh, <laughs> and we, I think with, we should keep it that yeah, way. Yeah. What with those uh, German uh, police dogs at your gate, that's pretty tough to get in. <laughs> it really is. It's, Scares off most of the tourists. <laughs> It'll do it. Uh, are you still taking your Spanish? We go to the same. Uh, That's true. Oscar, Oscar is Oscar and Julio. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, see now you speak. Now you went. How long did you go? You went. But you speak well, Spanish. They keep calling me because I I started and yeah. then I got, you know, my schedule changed and I didn't get back. I understand. But you you picked it up. Now it was very difficult for me. And Oscar told me that the only way that you could really learn, I had taken it about four or five months. He said no. the only way you could really learn is to go to Mexico, oh. because they don't obviously. I mean. They'd only speak Spanish, I guess, down there. But he said, if you get into a situation where that's all your life depends on it, you know, that uh, obviously you'll have to speak it. So I went down there with a uh, young lady. And um, okay. actually, she was about four years old, which was really <laughs> well, a south little of the bit border, there, a little than I there. had planned on at the time. But I went to a restaurant down there. And somehow you think you know Spanish before you actually start talking. And then when somebody starts talking back, Well, I'll no be the chance. major D. Oh, really? Come in and talk to me. Uh, como esta? Or do you say that? I forget. No, you well, you see, I had learned. <laughs> I see. Well, you see, I had learned it from a record, mm -hmm. so uh, I actually had to go down there. No now, going yeah. Down well, if I didn't run into Louisa on Fourth Street and looking for a men's clothing store, I was out of luck. But I went down and said, "What the heck? I'll, I'll give it a stay." Hola, Lisa. Hola. Uh, so I looked at the menu and discovered that I couldn't read anything, but of course didn't want to embarrass anybody. So I ordered calamara in su tinta which I found out later was octopus, octopus in its own ink. <laughs> <laughs> now, you like calamari, Yeah, huh? I like calamari, be, uh, and I thought, well, how can you go wrong? Until I saw it in its own ink. <laughs> and evidently, the guy wanted to give me a good-sized portion, so <laughs> this bowl, and it was in black ink. I mean, it was really, and it looked like a bunch of little plumber's helpers just floating in there. You know. <laughs> So I thought, I don't think I better eat this because, you know, you get ill on something like this. This could, well, you go to the hospital, they ask you for a specimen, you're sitting there with a bottle of Schaefer's ink, you know, so I said, this work out here. You passed on that. I passed on, I wrapped that in a napkin and carried it in my pocket and left the restaurant. So uh, had I been held up that night, I could have whipped that sucker out. <laughs> Why did you want to learn the Spanish in the first place? Well, 70% of the people, as you know, in, in, in uh, Los Angeles, where are we, Los Angeles? I have almost total recall right. on these cities. Um, <laughs> in Los Angeles, speak Spanish. And plus the fact, I, you it's know. It's a second language, yes, right, the United right, States. Yes, absolutely. And right. they're doing a lot of television down there, so I would like, you know, to do that. And also to learn to say, uh, don't shoot is good, too, yes. because you never know when they're, <laughs> when they're coming up. When they may turn against you, yeah. Yeah, if, if they uh, attack us, I want to be able to say, don't shoot, and you need a funny sidekick, because right. I think that's important. Important in this business. No. Now you're here to talk about your new series. Let's, I, I had no word on that. That's good. No. Yeah. Sure, come on. Yes, now. Ace Crawford, Private Eye. Private Eye. Yeah. Uh, I Have you ever played? A, well, you played a detective in the movie. Yes, yes. This is, but this is a very serious detective. We don't horse around anymore. This is. I'm really doing a very serious show this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I can say that in case people look at it and don't laugh. That's right. You know what the heck? It wasn't meant to be funny. Yeah. Yeah. Ron Clark, good what friend of mine. What kind of person is Ace? 
Well, he's um, he's a master detective. He's the one of the finest detectives in the, in this country or any other country you might imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, running around with a little sidekick, uh, Joe Rigobudo, who is now doing what I would do 20 years ago. He's getting all the mud and everything all over him, and I'm sitting there going, "That's too bad." So um, <laughs> you, you're it's not your bubble. Real good now, for me. You? Oh yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, we'll uh, be returning in a moment. That's all that means. Oh, that's right. Jody Foster and Marie Murphy will be with us. Uh, normally, I ask people who come on the show, do they have a film clip of their new show or movie? Yeah, yeah uh, uh, unfortunately, you're not allowed to show it because it's on another network, you oh, know, so, yes. uh, but we could run it anyway for us, I suppose, and then just not show it to the folks at home. Could bring it over the house or something, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we can't, we, no. have, we have none. We have none. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Well, these things happen, you know. Of course they do. <laughs> have you seen the, hmm? have you seen <laughs> Have you seen uh, our friend Harvey Corman, the new father? You the know, new father. New Harvey father. is a brand new father. He has a delightful little girl and, uh, and also a child. So he, uh, <laughs> no, he has a little baby girl and uh, they're just as happy as can be. That's Harvey, nice. uh, the child was born in 1983, which oddly enough will be the same age that Harvey will be when she graduates from college. <laughs> A lot, of guys, a lot of guys don't get their lives organized real early, you know what I mean? You just try to go right on there. Fortunately, I have mine pretty well under control. I now. know that. Are you, uh, yeah. are you seeing anyone, as they say? Anyone oh, special? I'm seeing a lot of people. They're not seeing me, but I... Uh, <laughs> I find when you get to this age, you, you really don't date. You, uh, what I have is a brochure. So, uh, <laughs> because I've heard those stories so often from myself about high school and college and the Army and everything, I just hand them a brochure, and then... If, in a week, if they like that, I go out and have dinner with them. And then I don't have to repeat all those Put stories. Put all those stuff in. Sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's going real well for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is it that... Is, were you skiing? Skiing. I... Somebody told me you, you had I, some problems. I, well, I gave up skiing because, well, I think it... Pardon me, Ed, but at our age, I think we should stop doing certain things, and skiing is probably one of them. Right. Uh, I had to give up boxing at a very young age because I... Uh, I didn't know you ever boxed. Oh, yeah, oh. but I, uh, I got a slight laceration in the corner of my left eyebrow that went to my elbow, and I gave <laughs> that up immediately because I knew that was not what I was going to do. I wanted to be a jockey, and, uh, of course, uh, when you weigh 140, the horses go... Excuse me. Um, <laughs> A little heavy here, isn't it? Uh, but I was supposed to go skiing, and a friend of mine who is an airplane pilot, um, now this story to me is kind of funny because the guy is all right, but he picked up a guy in Boston who got on, they said, can you hold the plane? We have a guy coming on who's in a wheelchair. And he came on with this routine, with the leg in a cast, and this arm with the brace, and a total head cast like this that went down to here. And they wheel him on, and the pilot, out of curiosity, said, uh, what happened? And the guy said, skiing. And he said, well, what happened? And the story was that he was on a chairlift, just going up the old mountain like this, and they come over kind of a ravine. And the cable came off at the end of the ravine, or up at the house there, and now they drop about 30 feet. But it catches, actually, because there's a take-up thing there. So they drop 30 feet, and he's sitting there with his friend, and now they're about maybe four feet off the ground, which they could have at that time gone, boy, that was close, and gotten off. <laughs> they decided, very bright, to sit in the chair until things got fixed. Well, it got fixed, but when they started it, they took up the slack too fast. And <laughs> the thing went up. <laughs> yeah. They shot him about another 50 feet in the air. <laughs> he was sitting in this chair going, well, now nah, we'll wait here, and all of a sudden, <laughs> now he's 110 feet in the air and no chair. <laughs> so, it's like a slingshot. Yeah, it catapulted him and his friend, who wasn't allowed to come back yet. I, he's probably still in Boston oh, in heavens. traction, but uh, he went uh, quite a ways up in the air. And then, you know, when you're coming down uh, a good 80 feet, just without skis on could be uh, amusing. But he now he has skis on coming down, trying to figure this out. And uh, he went into a snowbank, yeah. So he, uh, he didn't fare too well. So you gave that up? Yeah. No. Another doctor friend of mine was up skiing, and he did a little burp like this, and he went, ooh, boy, felt his ankle, and took his boot off and he was feeling it and he said, no, nah, I guess that's all. So he put his boot on it and the patrol came by and they said, what's wrong? He said, I just twisted my ankle a little bit and they said, well, we'll take you down. And he said, no, that's fine. I'm a doctor. I, I know that it's right. going to be okay. There's no reason. No, no, really. He said, 
in this cold weather, you really don't know whether you've broken anything or not, so let us take you down in what they call the banana. So it's like a long, looks like a banana, it's a sled, a guy in front and a guy in the back. And they strap you in this, and then they put a blanket over you and everything. Put you, and it's embarrassing, because people are going, what happened? Oh, and you're just kind of, well, I'm... <laughs> So he gets in this banana, and he's going now down the hill, going, gee, I know there's nothing wrong. And all of a sudden, he realizes that he's going a little bit faster than he was before. <laughs> So now he looks up, and evidently the guy in front had fallen down, and the guy in back had gone over him, and he'd fallen down. So now he's doing 180 in a banana. <laughs> yeah. He hit a pole in the banana and broke this leg and this shoulder and had a concussion, but his ankle was all right. <laughs> Sports story from the mountains of skiing. I love those stories. Aren't okay. those nice? The ski oh, people yeah. will be delighted. Oh, with those. Yes, I'm sure that they'll. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. I'll wait <laughs> My next guest, Maureen Murphy. You see, uh... Maureen Murphy has been with us several times before. She's a young comedian from Australia, and she works out material at the Improvisation in New York. And she's going to be appearing in Vancouver, Canada at Richards Hall next week, then in New Windsor, Ontario at the Top Hat March 14th, and at the Sahara Hotel, Sahara, Hotel, <laughs> Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas with Bobby Vinton, April 25th for one week. Would you welcome Maureen Murphy? Maureen. Just a thought. They say men invented the telephone. I don't know why they never call. I just spent weeks by the phone waiting for a man to call me. And while I was waiting, I thought about the relationship. I thought about the fights, the arguments, getting slapped, getting stood up. It's funny when you look back how you always remember the good times. <laughs> when I was growing up, my mother would always tell me the story of the beautiful princess who fell in love with the handsome prince. When she found out the prince was married, he told her he never slept with the queen and only lived in the castle for the kids' sake. I said, Mother, I never heard that fairy tale before. She said, you will. <laughs> so sometimes I feel I have missed out not being married and having kids. A friend told me there's nothing like the feeling she got when her child said its first words. Mama, Dada, was with blonde lady. <laughs> But men are very different than Australian men, where I was brought up in Australia. See, the Australian man's greatest sexual fantasy is to watch two women, one cleaning and one vacuuming. <laughs> They're so macho, they'll get a woman pregnant just to kill a rabbit. My father's a typical Australian. His idea of the perfect wife is Nancy Reagan. I met her in person, and I was so impressed, because she seemed so lifelike. <laughs> when I first started dating, I, I wanted to impress men. I was so dainty, I would try and eat without using my mouth. And when I first left school, I couldn't wait to be a woman. I bleached my hair, I put on the false eyelashes, the heavy makeup, the padded bra, the high heels, tight dress. I looked in the mirror and I thought, gee, it cost me my whole paycheck to look this cheap. <laughs> but even if you do all that, it's hard to hold on to a man. My girlfriend's boyfriend just walked out on her and I said, why did he leave? She said, I don't know, I, I just put the gun down for a minute. <laughs> In Australia, there's still the double standard. Going through puberty, my father told my brother, here's five dollars, go out and become a man. He told me, go out and become a woman, come back with five dollars. <laughs> my mother explained to me the difference between sex and making love. She said, sex is something that animals do. They just look at each other and then they do it. But human beings are on a much higher plane they have to have a couple of drinks first. <laughs> but my father was more cut and dried with his advice. He'd tell me, if you're good, you'll go to heaven. If you're bad, you'll go to hell. 
If you're real good, you'll go to heaven, but you'll get to go to hell on weekends. <laughs> he told me that women's role is because Australia was once the original Garden of Eden. And in the beginning, God created Adam and all the beer he could drink. <laughs> and God said, let there be light, beer. <laughs> Adam saw it was good. Then God created woman, and Adam was upset. He wanted a football. <laughs> Something he could grab, kick, and pass around to his friends without an argument. <laughs> he complained to God. He said to God, I thought you were on my team. God said, I am. I'm going to make woman the weaker sex. That will make you even more macho. They'll be shorter than you, so they'll have to wear high heels. That'll keep them out of sports. <laughs> they will have to dance backwards. <laughs> they'll get stuck with the kids, and I'll incapacitate them once a month. <laughs> and Adam says, now you're talking, mate. But when I broke up with the man I was in love with, I didn't have my parents to go to for advice. I was just so upset, and I went to a therapist. And he told me that being a woman was just a phase I was going through. <laughs> but I, was, I went to pieces over this man, and I was really hooked, and I had to do something drastic. Then I went to Love Enders. Well, they asked me. It really works. They asked me to bring in my favorite photograph of the man I wanted to get over. And then every day, they forced me to watch while they changed his face. They gave him stubborn eyes, a crooked smile, deep, deep wrinkles. They changed his whole character. And at the end of two weeks, they gave me back the photograph. And when I saw what he'd become, I knew I could never love this man again. <laughs> Very funny. Oh, looks like the audience have been to Love Enders, too. Yeah. Women to dance backwards? That's funny. Yeah. Are Australian men really different than American men? They are. Yeah. Of all the Australian movies, my father, I think, is, the, is a real typical Australian. As I said, you know, once I asked him what making love was, right. and he says he, he didn't know anything about it. He thought it was something that women do. <laughs> so it's a whole different approach. Went to a, Somebody asked me to an Australian wife swapping party, but it's not that exciting there because you get to clean another woman's house. <laughs> <laughs> we got to break away. I'll be right back. Stay where you are. I, uh, I don't know whether you're aware of this or not, but uh, Jodie Foster started making television commercials at the age of three was nominated for an Oscar by the time she was 14. She's now a student at Yale, I think, in her third year. And she's starring in Svengali, a movie for television which airs, as they say, on another network. Mm -hmm. On your show's on another network, too. Mm -hmm. On Wednesday, March 9th, she's about to begin production on the movie Hotel New Hampshire. Would you welcome, please, Jodie Foster. Caught in traffic tonight? Yes. Very I wonder what But I must tell you that yeah. it's uh, Svengali that airs on March 9th. Svengali, I was And on CBS. <laughs> What'd you say? Yes. Well, no, I didn't say it. They would have found it anyway. But uh, no. Hotel New Hampshire starts in April. Ah, okay. Yeah, I dropped by your dressing room to say hello before the show, and they said she's not here. And I said, uh uh. <laughs> she's on the Pacific Coast Highway, stuck in the mud. Uh, next time I'll take my VW. <laughs> yeah. What happened? You trusted somebody else to. Yeah. You know the last time you were on this show? I was you little, were... I think. You were 14 years old, okay. I believe, and now you're, was I right, third year? Yeah, now I'm 20. 20, third year at Yale. Yeah, junior. I think that's great. Yeah, I do too. You're serious about <laughs> your school, aren't you? Very much. I mean, I always have been, but it's, um, even when I was younger, I always knew that I would be going to college. It's never been any kind of... Really? Yeah, alternative, basically. So what, are you, what are you studying? Well, I'm a literature major, and uh, that's basically all I'm thinking about right now, right. reading a lot of books. Right. Um, do you have a normal life there, being well-known? Isn't it difficult to uh, go around to college, or do they? Or... 
Well, you make your normal life. I mean, I, you sort of have, I, I've always had a normal life. I wouldn't know what an abnormal life would be, or maybe well, it's the on, other way around. normal. I mean, you were making commercials when you were three, you've been in the public eye, you've... Uh... Well, the thing about Yale is that everybody there has some sort of specialty. You know, yeah. they're great scientists or great musicians, and so I'm just somebody that's come in with some sort of specialty. Right. And, you know, they've had three years to get used to it. Right. So I guess they're okay by now. Sven Gali is, now is this the movie with... Uh... Peter O'Toole. Peter O'Toole. Right. He's a remarkable actor. Oh, he's wonderful. He's yeah. incredible. He's one of the only people I know that can do the most outrageous, extreme things and somehow get away with it. You know, the whole Lawrence of Arabia hands out thing. And no one else in the world could pull it off. A little larger than life. I was watching, they, they replayed uh, on television the other night. They were playing My Favorite Year. Mm. Uh, and uh, I don't know anybody else could have done that that part as well as he did. Yes, it's true. And play it for comedy. This is a, a unique love affair, isn't it? Well, I suppose unique. Um, he's a Hungarian voice teacher, and I'm a sort of New York bohemian type rock star, and we hate each other. We start out absolutely despising each other, and I call him all sorts of names, he calls me names, and then suddenly the love story starts, and uh, I can't seem to sing without him being in the room. Ah. So, the yeah, but I won't tell you the end. <laughs> okay, all right. So we'll have to watch. Okay. Somebody told me you, know, you never took uh, acting lessons. No, I never did. I, it's either that I haven't had the time or I never thought of it, but I've been working for 17 years. Yeah, I couldn't so. believe what somebody <laughs> said you were doing. What, were you, what do you remember about uh, playing Moppets, I guess you'd call them, on, on television Moppets. commercials? I bet you somebody else wrote that, that for you. Moppets is a good word for it, a Moppet. <laughs> well, uh, I remember falling into a river once uh, in Sacramento. I remember a lot of things. You know, I was bitten by a lion once. Uh, I worked with camels and pigs. And uh, I remember everybody always calling me the kid. I mean, I never had a name. I was always called the kid. But it was fine. It's like growing up, it's given me an education I wouldn't have had. You know, been able to go to places and learn different languages. And, uh, you know, talk with grown-ups, meet with grown-ups, and not be afraid to talk about politics or what I thought about civil rights, you know, right. that kind of thing. Did you feel uh, at all at that time you, you were missing any childhood? As you said, to you it was normal because well, you were I always in it. I missed all the bad parts of childhood. You know, I missed waking up and saying, oh, this boy doesn't like me, or oh, I have acne and everyone hates me. I, that somehow I passed all that up. But the good things about it I certainly got, and maybe I got later when I could appreciate them, certainly in college. Yeah. You know, where I'd never really been around certainly 1,600 people, I, you know, my own age. Yeah. So that was a whole education in itself, too. I know you probably don't really want to get into this, but it's almost hard to avoid. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. No, I, 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 don't, I, I don't mean it, because people... Uh, I, it, it obviously had to be a very traumatic thing for you, this uh, mm -hmm. John Hinckley obsession with you. Um, and you had the... Uh, you were able to get through that all right and stay on a fairly normal level? How, how, how did you handle that? Well, that's a, that's a big question. I mean, mostly I was at school. And right. uh, the best place in the world for me to be would, would have been at Yale, where everybody was incredibly protective, yeah. certainly. And, um, and it's, been a, it's been a while now. The best thing we can say about it is that it's over. And also, you know, I grew up in a business where you had to learn to deal with troubleshooting situations. Right. And in some ways, I think actors are probably better prepared for things like that because you have to deal on a grown-up level you know, right. every day, uh, something, you know, either your cues are off or someone's yelling at you or whatever it is. Right. And, uh, and so you learn to draw on <coughs> survival things that you wouldn't have normally, yeah. possibly. I just wondered in your, in, in, in your private moments, if, if that ever goes through your head and causes you any undue concern or, uh, well, or worry? Well, it has also been an education. I wrote a, uh, a piece for Esquire that sort of talked about that. And yes, there were things that had to be worked out, but once they're worked out, once you've uh, written them down or say express them, I don't know, theatrically, right. um, that you have room for other things. And now yeah. I have room for a lot more literature and a lot more philosophy right. and a lot more, uh, you know, those kind of but tracks. I had to be unpleasant to go through it. I think you handled it very, very well. Thank you. Because uh, that, that is tough to handle. What kind of literature are you taking? American literature, English literature or what? No. Uh, well, right now I'm, well, I started out with classics and then I went to modernism and then I went to women's fiction and now it's black women's fiction and then it's Afro-American oral narrative. So it shifts every day. Basically. Yeah, is this just, just complete what you feel yourself as a person or something you want to um, have to do with your acting or something that you ever want to teach? Uh, I, only, I always wanted to teach only so I could get up in front of like 20 people and tell them all they were jerks, you know? I always <laughs> wanted to do that. Have that kind of really, that position of power I think would be wonderful, but certainly not as a profession. What I want to do is write fiction mostly. Right. 
you know. Have you, uh, are you writing? Do you, do you like to write? Well, I'm writing now for different publications, mm -hmm. um, essays and things like that, and interviews. Yeah. Uh, but fiction, no. I really haven't written that much fiction. Yeah. That's what I really like to be doing now. Do you see acting always being a part of your life, or could you divorce <laughs> yourself and step away from it and say... Well, I've been doing it for so many years, saying, yeah. I couldn't imagine not acting. Uh, but at the same time, I certainly couldn't imagine only doing that. Right. I mean, for three months a year, just doing that and then sort of going to the gym or, yeah. you know, taking voice lessons or something. Who do you gym. listen to for advice? Do you have a close advisor or do you listen to yourself mainly? And Well, I listen to myself, <laughs> don't we all? Yeah. Uh, but I do listen to my mother. Yeah. Um, and who tells me everything from, you know, whatever there is. And we get into big fights and, you know, we make up and we cry and we do all that, but we're still best friends. That's great. Yeah. We'll take a break. We shall be right back in just a moment. We've just got a minute or so here. I hate to ask fan magazine questions, but... Uh, uh oh any... <laughs> No, I mean, you know, people always want to know what your status is, who you're going with, you're planning to get married, would you like to get married, stuff, stuff like that. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> Are you asking the question now? No, 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 no I didn't no, mean no, personally. I didn't no, think so, no. No, I thought you... No, this was not a proposal. <laughs> uh, would, you, would you marry another actor? No, uh, I haven't thought about marriage. I've only thought about children. <laughs> is that a terrible... I think you're no. not supposed to do that. But I, it's only because, like, I want to name my children certain names. Like what? Jetson. Jetson? Jetson, after the Jetsons. <laughs> right? Don't we all love the Jetsons? But that could be done, I guess. Uh -huh, I grew up with the Jetsons. That was it. Yeah. But I haven't thought about marriage, no. Just, just the children. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I guess people work that out in different ways. <laughs> and the clothes. Have mine, I know. You have five, don't you? <laughs> I have six. You could have mine. Six. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Rental on weekends or something oh, yeah. like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to have you here, really. Nice to meet Good you. Good to see you. Here. Don't make it another. Uh, Six or seven years. Come back and see us, will you? I'll come back and marry you, and we can have a really good child. <laughs> no, go for it, sure. Anyway, Maureen, is thank you. That was a very, very sweet of you to say that. Uh, but. No, it's been a long time since I... Uh, what am I reading here? 